Welcome to the Collegium, our monthly magazine program in three parts. Cinema, State of Affairs, and our arts calendar. And welcome to our State of Affairs 2 portion of the program, where we're very pleased to be joined by Dr. Sabina Grund. Dr. Grund, welcome to the Collegium. Thank you. Well, my pleasure. You have been busy in Berlin for a number of years. For the people who don't know all of the wonderful things you're doing, tell us about your background. Um, I studied political science and uh, after uh, some experience in banking and a short experience in consulting, I came to Berlin to do some political consulting with an old friend of mine, acquaintance. And unfortunately this wasn't very successful financially and so um, I became a freelance journalist here and I discovered um, through a group of Africa experts what our politics toward Africa had been in the negative. Mm -hmm. um, this was a very um, surprising um, discovery for me um, as this had not been part of my political science training. Um, so as a journalist I discovered another side in political um, Berlin um, I then got to publish a couple of articles, very few, on Central Africa, um, in especially the genocide in Rwanda and how this has played out in the Congo, uh, which is ongoing until today. Um, when we speak today about Africa in the public awareness, um, it has been raised dramatically, I think, by the election of Barack Obama as President of the United States. So um, I think this helps Africans anywhere in the world to make their case, to become more visible, to become part of the international political scene. Um, I think this is playing out positively and I hope that our efforts as a small group in Berlin is now also having a positive effect that Africans can represent their interests. We are a mixed group, German-African, we hope to grow and especially get new African members from any countries and we want to present the case of Africa in Germany, in Berlin. Africa is uh, seen as the coming economic dynamo. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? What is your opinion about uh, Africa eventually being a player on the stage in a way that China or Brazil is, or maybe even the United States of America? I think there are very positive developments. There's a very fast growth, say in Nigeria, mm -hmm. uh, catching up with South Africa, which has been the major financial weight on the continent. Um, the Congo is definitely one of those countries at, close to my heart is making big progress um, because of the Chinese partly and uh, we have to remember that the Chinese in the early period of Mao had a very positive reputation in Africa. They actually built uh, this 1800 kilometers railway for the Africans. They did infrastructure projects which they are doing again today. When Western uh, companies go there with quite often also failed projects, what the Chinese have focused on is what they focused on for their own country not so long ago, which is basic infrastructure. That's something that lasts. Not one company here or one big white elephant they used to be called there, but basic infrastructure, schools, hospitals and roads and, and trains. And I think that will help even a country as chaotic as the Congo. 
So let's hope for the best, but at the same time you have to foresee that governments that are notoriously weak will have problems managing all the different interests, the domestic business interests plus the foreign interests. What is the relationship between, as you just talked about, the, the, the disruption or the chaos that uh, exists in the parts of the Congo, what is the relationship between that, those problems and some of the surrounding countries? Oh, there's, um, there's a history um, of violence that comes from uh, Rwanda into the Congo, um, ignited by the genocide in Rwanda. But then we have to go back more. Mm -hmm. Uh, the genocide in Rwanda has um, a, a longer background that goes to 1st October um, 1990, when actually um, Rwanda was attacked as a country from Uganda, from that small force, uh, well-equipped force of exiled Tutsi. Um, uh, you may remember that Rwanda is constituted by uh, Hutu and Tutsi, although the distinction is sometimes a bit artificial because intermarriage has been common. Um, there has still been um, a certain division between these two groups, and the Tutsi only make up about 14-15% of the country. Uh, somebody counted that in 1990 there were about 600,000 Tutsi only in uh, Rwanda. Um, the genocide in 1994 is supposed to have killed about a million people. So there must have, and there were supposedly 300,000 surviving Tutsis. So what you count is about 300,000 Tutsis and about 700,000 Hutus were killed. Actually, the, the, the 94 genocide of which we've only had very short mention in the Western media at the time when it happened and shortly afterwards, that genocide was uh, layers of violence, obviously, uh, going in different directions. Um, but coming back to my point about the attack from Uganda to on Rwanda uh, that was conducted by a group of Tutsi rebels, uh, those were uh, the children of people who went into exile in Uganda in 1962 when the UN sponsored independence of Rwanda uh, was introduced with elections and the elections in Rwanda had to be won by the ethnic uh, majority of Hutus. So um, the Tutsi who attacked uh, Rwanda as their country to be regained they wanted to regain the power that they lost with independence. Uh, this is in stark contrast uh, to the developments in South Africa, where in the same year, 94, you had this big process of opening. And from 1990 on, uh, when the wall had come down in Berlin and the East-West conflict ended in that sharp form, mm -hmm. um, democratization was supposed to, to cover all of Africa. And what the Tutsi did in 94, they finally ended that uh, possibility of democracy in Rwanda, which the old government still tried to transition in. So um, our political discourse about Rwanda isn't straightforward. It, it omits a lot of detail that is very important. And what is the relationship to some of the circumstances that you're describing and uh, the West? Well, the, um, the Tutsi group that came from Uganda was actually uh, got military training from both Uganda and Western sites, the US specifically, I know, others maybe. Um, so there was a very strong Western backing uh, from Britain and America specifically, uh, circles in Germany and other countries included. Um, this was a Western uh, enterprise uh, of sorts to introduce, to, to reintroduce these Tutsis into uh, Rwanda and to overthrow the, the Hutu government that had been the, in power for quite a long time. Of course, Rwanda had not become a perfect democracy from 1962 to 1994. At the same time, the country was struggling like others and was in the process of reform. So there was no way you could justify such a military overthrow, which was uh, culminating in the shooting down of the airplane of the running president 
and his Burundian counterpart who was also on the plane, plus some military staff of the country. So um, one thing that is politically contested and rather not spoken about is who shot down that plane. Um, that's something to be resolved. And then we come to three months of genocide from April to June, uh, early July uh, 94. And then we come to the huge question of refugees. An estimated two million Rwandans left Rwanda to the neighboring countries in 94. Um, and you had a large number of those people allegedly killed in the Congo. There were huge refugee camps, they were, they were filmed, and days later there was empty space. And there is still no explanation for how this happened, nor is there any public investigation by our media. That's a huge shortcoming. And in terms of the current uh, substantial investment by the Chinese, how does this portend for the future? Uh, what is your opinion of that? That's very hard to predict. Um, I've sometimes noticed a strange kind of racism. I've had Africans, individuals, tell me, you know, we really prefer you to the Chinese. And I'm like, actually, why? If I were you, maybe I would think differently. But um, at the same time, the Chinese have to prove themselves in what they do for them. And I think this will play out in the longer run. There's countries uh, like Angola has been presented on the BBC recently as being very fortunate with the Chinese, on very good terms, doing good deals, uh, mutually beneficial. There's other countries where you have one or another Chinese private investor who the country is not happy with, of mm -hmm. course, and some people are ripping off a country. Um, but there has to be, a, a general trend has to develop. Mm -hmm. And there's people who constantly paint a nasty picture of the Chinese in Africa. I don't think that is correct. Mm -hmm. I think there's a mixed picture and there's very positive and there's less positive cases. We will see how it plays out, but we have to consider as Western countries that the Chinese are just a major force just because there are so many going into Africa doing things. Mm -hmm. At some point we'll wake up and things will have changed dramatically and people won't have realized that in the meantime mm -hmm. we've lost our way. And what is the situation, how does Africa fit into this uh, um, contest, if you will, perhaps unfortunate, between the United States and China or the West and China? Well, that, that is for the future to show. Um, I think um, Definitely Africa has more and more of a middle class, slowly growing, but still growing. Um, and um, people are looking like to, to Brazil today as a new power. Mm -hmm. There's cases now that unemployed people from Portugal caught in the Western economic crisis are going to Angola and other places to get jobs. Mm -hmm. They bring some training from Portugal and the Angolans are happy. And at that point, the old racist divide is kind of reversing. That's a very healthy process for our international cooperation. Mm -hmm. And I think cooperation on an equal level between people will become more normal. Mm -hmm. And I just keep thinking for the last years, all the horror that has been inflicted on some countries in Africa by certain Western groups, political circles, mm -hmm. Things have been recorded. There are people in Africa who are carefully recording things. This will come up and be discussed in, in the public, in the media, in the African media, and eventually in international courts. Mm -hmm. And I would think if, if you have an, a nasty um, heritage to deal with, rather bring it up front and deal with it quickly, then let it languish and, and become bigger and bigger and people get more and more angry that this is still unresolved. Mm -hmm. So um, the group that I'm working with, we are pleading to have the, the, the many massacres that happened in Congo finally acknowledged internationally as crimes against humanity mm -hmm. so that we bring what has been brutal personal and, and military struggles on a legal sphere and, and deal with it on a legal level. That's how you civilize conflicts.
bring them out into the legal sphere. Now, when you bring the, if the case ever comes to court, how do you handle that? Uh, what about the contributors to the situation and the people who actually were involved with these unfortunate events? Uh, that's, that's a huge question that we can only tackle one step at a time, I mm -hmm. think. Um, you have a growing awareness in the Western public, in those circles that are dealing with online information that goes beyond our media. Um, there are various circles who are learning and, and want to learn more. And we have cooperation uh, among Westerners and Africans, and I think the Afro-Americans also have an important bridge to build here, and are building that bridge in parts. So um, we'll have to see how this plays out, and we have to see who in the Western public is, is finally taking up the cases. Like, for instance, you had Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International mm -hmm. being pretty silent on the horrors in these countries for many years. And nowadays, uh, you see one press declaration after another of both Human Rights Watch and Amnesty being very critical of the militia in the Congo. Um, specifically, the so-called M23 is now discussed, but there's others too. Um, you, you have a, a growing awareness, you have a changing of direction, um, you have a political awareness on the, on, the sphere, in, on, the, on the scene of the United Nations and in our governments now that aid to Rwanda has been slowly cut. Mm -hmm. That's a positive development. We'll have to see how this progresses and maybe accelerates. What role, in your opinion, does the United Nations has it played and does it play and can it play in the, in the development or the support of Africa? The United Nations is a gathering of states. Mm -hmm. um, so what you mostly had is a Security Council uh, gridlocked mm -hmm. or, or dominated mm -hmm. by the leading powers, yeah. mostly the Western powers. Yeah. Nowadays you have more um, a counterweight in Russia and China though that is changing depending on the issues. Um, I'll be interested to see how it plays out when, when especially, especially China has a growing role in Africa. Um, we'll, we'll have to see, and I think the, the United Nations, uh, given the, the BRICS now, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, given that new block in the world across continents, um, the United Nations could become a different forum mm -hmm. if, if different regions uh, insist on having more impact. Mm -hmm. So what are your plans now for the future? Which direction, which way is up for what it is you're doing? Um, well, our, our group of about eight people now, yes. uh, add some, subtract some, um, we have uh, started to address uh, the German political scene. We've written to Parliament. We've got some indirect but somehow productive response, responses, maybe. Uh, we want to pursue this further. And we are hopefully um, gaining signatures to our petition, we, which we put up on change.org, mm -hmm. uh, to recognize the crimes against humanity in the Congo. Um, we also have a Facebook site which is called Liberated Congo, mm -hmm. whereby Congo is with a K, so it's an English-German site um, which also uh, contains a lot of French information. Mm -hmm. uh, it's directed to the Africans and to those interested in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, there's very little in German that we can put there, so it's mostly English and, and French content all kinds of international studies, UN publications, n media things. So people are invited to, to pick up information and to distribute it and to make others aware and make the community grow that deals with the region of Central Africa. Dr. Sabina Grund, it's a pleasure to have you join us here on the Collegium and we look forward to your future success. Thank you. So stay with us and remember you are participating in what else but the collegium.